Good morning, everyone. I'm Quinn Wisson with Vertical Measures, and I'm here hosting VM's monthly webinar series. Today's webinar is titled, Stop Playing the Google Yo-Yo Game and Win with Real SEO, and will be presented by our special guest host, Alan Blyweiss. Alan has been an intermarketing specialist and SEO expert for over a decade. Performing over 60 strategic site audits a year, he has an intimate understanding of how to create a stable, sustainable web presence in organic search results through thousands of hours of analysis, recommendations, and review of real-world results. He's also a respected author, industry speaker, and blogger. Before we get started and I hand over the presentation to Alan, I just have a couple of notes. We will be making today's webinar available for everyone here by the latest Monday afternoon, barring any technical difficulties. We'll also be happy to answer your questions, so please make sure to ask them in the question applet located on your screen, or you can also tweet us using the hashtag VMWebinar. You can ask questions during the webinar, and we'll have a few minutes at the end where we can chat with Alan about those answers. Any questions we don't get to, we'll be sure to try and answer afterwards. If you're having any technical difficulties, please attempt to reconnect. So with all my notes complete, I will hand over the presentation to our special guest, Alan Blyweiss. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for taking this time out of your day to uh, sit in on this webinar. Uh, and uh, I hope that you're able to get something of value from my presentation. Uh, if you have any questions that come up and we're not able to answer them during the webinar, uh, if you want to get a hold of me afterwards, uh, you can do so. I'm at Alan Blyweiss, and you'll see my Twitter handle on the bottom of my slides as I go through the presentation. So here we go. Is everybody ready? Let's do this. Uh, so just to recap, I've got 17 years of internet marketing experience. Uh, I've been doing SEO uh, in one form or another since around 2000, 2001. Uh, and I work on small, medium, and large scale sites, but my most enjoyable audit work comes when I'm dealing with a client that's got site, a site with tens of millions of pages. Uh, because that's when it gets really interesting. Uh, the issues that you might face with a smaller site still apply to a larger site, uh, but they become magnified. Uh, and it, it's really fascinating work. Uh, just as a general example, some of the kind of clients that I work on, like I said, they're not all multi-million page websites, but they're really highly trafficked sites for the most part. And uh, regardless of the size of the site, uh, these are the kind of sites that have had a lot of SEO applied to them over time. Uh, and I get brought in even in that scenario because clients want to be able to get to the next level, and that's where I can help. In this webinar, I'm going to be talking about five uh, key areas. Understanding sustainable SEO versus myopic SEO the five most common SEO mistakes, why just writing good content is a fallacy. Uh, I want to touch briefly on the importance of critical thinking in SEO, and then I want to wrap it up by talking about how to prioritize the action plan that you have for how to improve the SEO of your web presence. So from a sustainable versus myopic SEO perspective, this is the approach that I take because I don't believe in the notion of white hat versus black hat. Uh, techniques that are perfectly legitimate and therefore quote unquote white hat, when taken to an extreme, can be perceived as quote black hat. Uh, what I care about more is what's going to stand the test of time and what's going to have to be redone the next time Google makes a major change or an update in their algorithms. Uh, and this is where I've come to define over the last few years the concept of sustainable versus myopic SEO. With sustainable SEO, we're looking to build a foundation that is going to last the test of time. Uh, it's really true and not just uh, cliche to talk about quality. 
because as flawed as the search engines are, their ultimate goal is to provide quality. And the way they do that is they mathematically attempt to simulate a user's experience. The more you can understand that that's what their algorithms are all about, no matter what the infighting might be in some circles about what their motives are for business purposes, when it comes to search results in the organic listing, they really do their best to emulate what a user is going to experience. Bear with me just one moment. Okay. With myopic SEO, it, it's, it's always about how can we get ahead sooner, faster, and cheaper. Uh, there's little or no consideration for the user experience and uh, they'll do whatever they can. People that use Myopic SEO will do whatever they can because they either hear about the next magic bullet and somebody says it got them results, uh, or I know enough people that play with Myopic SEO or use Myopic SEO as an intentional business model uh, that it's all about making more money sooner, regardless of what the consequences are long term. Uh, so again, just to wrap up, sustainable SEO, it's long lasting. It gives you the opportunity to gain ground and then build on that ground that you've already gained, right? Uh, with myopic SEO, you have to throw out half of what you've done previously and sometimes more. Uh, in this year, 2012, uh, it's even got to the point where people are needing to burn their entire sites down uh, in some severe situations. And everything that I talk about in my presentation moving forward is focused on the concept of sustainable SEO. Uh, so let's talk about the five most common SEO mistakes that I happen to find. Depending on the work that you do, you may have, if, if you have exposure to more than one site or if you're at an agency or you're a consultant, you might have a different list. This is just my experience uh, and it's based on uh, this year's work that I've done that involves over 250 million pages indexed on the internet. Uh, and uh, like I said, I average 60 to 80 audits a year. So I've seen a, a large range of site types and common issues come up over and over again. So a topical dilution. A topical dilution is the notion that the search engines need to determine what is the topical focus of this page, and then bigger than that, what's the topical focus of this section and of this website. The most common issue that I find is people try to go too far with getting pages found for too many different keywords. And it doesn't mean you can't get a page found for a lot of keywords, but the issue is how refined is the focus of the set of keywords that you are targeting or that you ultimately get found for. Uh, one great example, automobiles, cars, vehicles, motorized transportation, four-wheel transport, right? You could use all of these to describe cars that are dri driven on the street because they all apply. But just look here at how diverse the topical focus really is. Uh, you know, as soon as you get to vehicles, motorized transportation, and four-wheel transport, yeah, they apply to cars, but the truth is they apply to a lot of other things as well, right? And uh, that's a key issue. How refined is the focus that you are working on signaling to the search engines? Uh, topical dilution is the number one problem that I find. But it's not just with the keywords you choose. When you're looking at a page, there's other stuff that can go on on that page that's going to dilute from the topical focus of that unique page. Right? So there's too many distractions around that main content. And it's content and links that are not directly related to the page's topical focus. The call out boxes that you have on article pages uh, of the sidebar information you have on article or product or information pages, uh, all of these different call-out boxes and widgets are going to ultimately detract from the topical focus of a particular page. And this is especially serious when 
there's not enough main content in the content area of that page anyhow, uh, this just makes it even worse, right? Uh, but think about it. If you've got links to other articles or recommended reading or top stories or any of these other widgets, those are words on the page. Those are links that have code added to the page. And those links have URLs in them, and there's potentially quite likely going to be words in those URLs. All of those additional words that are talking about something that might, quote, unquote, seem similar or be related, or just as often as not, I found, isn't related to that topic at all, but it's related to something else on the website, that's diluting the topical focus. And then topical dilution also comes when there's a lack of consistency across multiple signals specific to a page. Starting with the title, the URL, the breadcrumb, the header tags, you know, even the internal uh, linking structure that you have within your own site, there needs to be consistency of, of topical focus, right? And this is why it's critical to stay with no more than two primary phrases for any single page, and then minor seeding of two or maybe three other phrases that you intentionally, consciously work into the variety of signals that exist that say this page is about this topic. You need to be able to reinforce the message that that's what the topic is. The next issue I find is poor information architecture. Right? With poor information architecture, there are a number of issues. But the single biggest issue that I find is I hear so often, well, we have to have a flat architecture. And that's why we ended up with all of our products are at mydomain.com forward slash here's the content. What ends up happening is you end up having thousands of URLs, thousands of pages that all appear based on the URL structure to be right off of the home page, the root domain. The truth is that's not reality when it comes to proper content organization. And in fact, you're attempting in that scenario to tell the search engines, every page on our website is as important as every other page. As much as you may want that to be true, it's not. The umbrella topics that groups of content belong in are really more important from a user experience perspective at a, in a volume uh, view. Okay, It doesn't mean that you can't get important association to deep pages. It just means you need to accept the reality of what's really important. And from there, yeah, you want to have as few clicks as reasonable, but don't go for as few clicks as possible, and don't represent that short access point in your URLs. Create true buckets of content. It's really important to establish that the category is really not only more important, but we can prove it's more important because not only do the links come underneath that category, but look, all of the URLs reinforce the fact that they're part of this category. It's a very strong signal to take advantage of, and I encourage you to do so. So poor information architecture, right? Another issue is how often do you go to a website and you see a situation where you go, the main navigation has a 1,000 links in it? You know, this is a really common issue these days because people want everybody that visits their site to get immediately directly accessible to their content, right? In all of the eye tracking and click-through studies that I have found on small, medium, and enterprise scale sites, I have never found a situation where the 89th link in your main navigation is ever anywhere near close to being clicked on as often as the more important, higher level umbrella links. So you may be under the illusion that it's important to, to load your main navigation with all of those links, but it's not properly communicating what the content relationships are. So section out your sub-navigation properly. Users are mature enough and intelligent enough online that they're not afraid to click into a category to see what content you have within that category, right? So take advantage of that trust with the user, and you'll get your SEO value as well. 
bear with me. I've just got to take a moment here. I've got to get some water. All right, so another common issue I find with uh, shopping cart systems is trying to get products into six categories. Yeah, okay, so maybe people use a variety of keywords to find what they're looking for, but you site owners take it way too far, okay? So if you've got a desk, a school desk, and you sell school furniture, uh, and it's a desk that's used in classrooms, that desk could also potentially be used in offices within the school building or administrative offices for the school district, right? So do you stick that product in the school desk category and the school classroom category and the school office furniture category? Well, you can, but the problem is if you create three URLs that are each unique in those funnels, you're telling Google that that product itself isn't about a primary topic. It's about several different topics. It confuses the search engines about what the topical value of that particular product is. And again, not every category is as important for every single product that's in it, right? And you need to remember that and accept that that's true. So when you're deciding where to put products, think about what's the most important category that this product belongs in. And then if you want, you can include the thumbnail and the product name and the link to that product within other categories. But that should lead that person to a different category URL structure when they actually click to go to that product itself. That's ideal best practices SEO. Even though you're taking one product and you're listing it in another category, you need to find a way to signal this is the most important category for this product. If you don't, the best practice is to really create six copies of that product with different SKU numbers and completely different descriptions. But can you do so and maintain scalability if that's your plan? Be aware of that and think about that. All right, improper pagination, big deal. With improper pagination, we've got a scenario where too many people believe that uh, canonicalized architecture is the proper way to deal with several pages of content. That's not true. It is absolutely not true. If I've got five pages of products, there are two ways to go. You can have a view all, as uh, Miley Oye from Google suggests, which I do suggest under limited circumstances. But if you've got 60 or 80 or 200 products, view all is a terrible version of your content for indexation purposes because you're forcing your users to have to scroll and scroll and scroll to find things, let alone the issues of page load time. And I'm going to talk about page load time later on in terms of where this, this is another cause of major flaw in thinking. When you've got 200 products uh, and using content delivery networks and other methods, right? So in my experience, maximum value comes from keeping multiple pages, having a unique URL for each one, and using the rel next and rel prev tags, right? And inserting page X at the end of the page title and the H1 tag, and that's all you need to do. Five pages of products under a specific category reinforces in tremendous ways that that category really is a big category. And with the rel next, rel prev, and the unique URL structure, you actually do signal to Google this entire group relates to this umbrella topic, and it reinforces the value of that bigger topic significantly. But the other value I found when I have clients open up their pagination this way is the keyword count that people use to find their products goes up exponentially because of the additional pages that are indexed with all of the different products. They're already unique pages because they have unique products from page to page, right? 
So you don't need to worry about, well, they're all the same. They're not all the same. Pagination, big deal. Over-optimization, this has been a buzzword this year, but I've seen it for a few years now. Uh, like I said earlier in this talk, trying to get your page ranked for more than just a couple of primary phrases and a couple or a few second tier phrases, I see it way too often, okay? And then on a bigger scale, trying to rank your home page for 500 phrases. You know, think about the concept of that. If you implement SEO properly across your entire site, yes, your site will over time be found for hundreds or thousands or more phrases. But don't try to force your homepage to be found for those sooner than it deserves to rank for them. Uh, one of the most common signs and symptoms of when that's being done is when your homepage outranks an internal page for a refined or long tail keyword phrase where that internal page really is the more important and more focused page for that topic. All right? Yeah, there's some value in having your own page ranked for that variety of topics, but if you think about the user, if you get your home page ranked instead of a deep page ranked for a particular topic, the user is going to have to click more to get to that topic and they may not find it so easily when they go to your home page. So it's much better to send them directly to the page that they're looking for. You'll get more value in the long run by doing that on scale. Site speed, big deal. Uh, first signs of this came with the Panda update uh, in the spring of last year, and uh, I've seen sites that have suffered site speed as a primary Panda contributor, although it's not consistently the only major indicator with Panda, and some sites that have really good speed were still hit by Panda, but it's one of the many issues that Panda brought to the surface. And I've seen situations with clients where simply changing their information architecture and their template at the code level by cleaning up those things that we, I've already touched on and that are listed on this uh, slide can literally overnight double their organic listing tra based search traffic. It's that fast under certain circumstances that Google responds to a better page speed. I'm not saying that they will always respond that fast, but I have enough real world experience with enough clients gaining ground just by fixing site speed to know that it's a factor to be concerned about. All right. External link footprint weakness. Yeah, we talk about links and the importance, and in 2012, now we've got the penguin update and manual penalties for unnatural links as perceived by Google, and the bin disavow tool, and now the Google disavow tool. Well, when you're talking about quality of links, there's way too much emphasis put on too few keywords, even if all of your links are really high quality. If all you're focusing the anchor text of those links on is your top two or three or four phrases, that's not a good overall link footprint, and it's a sign that you're trying to unnaturally manipulate search rankings as compared to the way the internet works separate from SEO. The internet works separate from SEO where people create links because they want to and they use a whole range and variety of words in their anchor text, right? So you need to emulate that if you're going to unnaturally try to communicate to Google, we've got a whole bunch of people on the internet that think our stuff is important, right? And the game of C-block diversity, guess what? That's so ancient it's sad, okay? C-block diversity, meaning, well, we have to show that links come from different domains, so the way to do that is to get one hosting provider to put all of our fake websites on different servers that they have around the country. No, sorry. Search engines are quite capable and have been for a long time now of seeing networks of sites and uh, hosting provider originated content. And uh, so don't just be aware of the fact that 
trying to fake the real world is more challenging and difficult than ever before. And the notion of C block diversity is not acceptable as a best practice. It's just not. Okay, uh, burning through thousands of links acquired, you know, at ten cents a link or ten dollars a link, five dollars a link, that's dead. If it's not causing problems for you right now, it will eventually. And just ask anybody who was hammered in the spring of this year, who thought that they were immune how they feel now after the fact, because they thought, oh, it still works for us, OK? To be aware of these issues, I still see this going on to this day, even after all of the changes Google has made. Uh, the content that those links come from off-site, yeah, you go to a restaurant website, and there's a link to an auto parts store in one of the articles on the restaurant website. Really? Yeah, it's a common thing. People think that they can get away with it, and some people still get away with it, but less people get away with it now than ever before. And when I have clients clean this garbage up, they get positive organic search results. It's worth the effort to clean it up, and it's even more valuable now than ever to just not go there anymore, OK? But it's not just about the article. If it's a restaurant website, the restaurant website shouldn't have an article about automotive parts so that the article matches the link, because it's still a restaurant website. Where that's valid to have that kind of article from time to time, because people talk about what they want to talk about on their blogs, there is some natural reality to that. I, often, I see too often where it's the majority of your links. Not good. All right. Why just writing good content is unacceptable as a belief system? You know, Google no longer says just write good content. They now say writing good content is the most important thing. So they have shifted to that degree. But when you look at all of the ways that Google has come up with their own unique add-on methods of defining content, defining intent, defining relationships, all of those all along have been signals and signs from Google saying, we need your help. You can complain all you want about the notion that Google shouldn't have to ask for our help. But the reality is they're dealing with billions of pages of content across millions of websites, right? And thousands upon thousands of different site architectures that are out there. And there's more all the time. Right? They need our help to understand their content and the focus. We need to be able to send multiple signals to the search engines wherever possible, right? Even without the extra snippets and uh, sitemap.xml files and schema.org, we have all along, even with pure HTML, we have page titles and URLs and H1 tags and content text and link anchor text has been there all along anyway. Those are all multiple signals, right? And the more consistent you are with them, the more you help them figure things out. So now there's just more ways that you can help them out, OK? Uh, but don't cross your signals. If you have an entry in your robust file that says, don't index this page, don't go ahead and put a no index follow tag in the header I see that happen so often, it's amazing. If you're saying no index but follow, that tag says to Google, yeah, this page really isn't important, but all of the pages that it links to are really important, and we don't think you can find those pages other ways. So ignore the robots instruction and crawl the page anyway, right? Those are cross signals. You don't want to have three different signals that are all conflicting with each other. OK? You need to be consistent. I started seeing this year where pages that are listed in the robots.txt file are still ending up being crawled by the search engines when they shouldn't be, right, because of cross-signaling. Some of those are actually ending up being indexed, which is a direct violation of the bigger goal of the robots file inclusion because of cross-signal confusion, all right? Social media engagement is critical to SEO. 
just writing good content is worthless. If you've got a tree that falls in the woods and there's nobody around, nobody's going to hear that the tree fell. And the guy who has a fireplace in the middle of winter won't know that a tree fell, saving him a lot of effort to have to go and find a tree that's dead somewhere else to cut up the firewood to keep his house warm, right? So you want to let people know, hey, you got a tree that just fell in your backyard here, free firewood. You can't just put it on the web and hope people are going to find it. Yes, the search engines will eventually maybe find your content because of links and all the rest of it. And yes, you can submit it with the site map and all of the rest of that stuff. But you can only get 10 pages indexed on the first page of results, and in some cases, seven results indexed, right? You need to go outside of your comfort zone, if that's not within your comfort zone, to reach out and engage people in the real world. Most of us already know this, but it's a reinforcement of the concept that just writing good content is not truth. It's not enough. All right? Critical thinking. Let's touch briefly on critical thinking. We're almost done, so bear with me. All right, critical thinking. The, the biggest reason when I talk with people who end up implementing myopic SEO without realizing they've been implementing it is because they're not thinking outside of their understanding. And this is not about somebody being more intelligent than somebody else or somebody being you know, an insider and somebody's not. Uh, this is about the concept that we need to recognize and accept the fact that the web is a much more complex environment than it was in 1995. And people are much more diverse than our own individual uniqueness, right? And because of that combination of truths, we need to understand that SEO takes time to think beyond our own thinking and our own opinions. So when we get upset that search engines shouldn't have to rely on us to figure it out for them. <coughs> We're not bringing critical thinking into the reality of what they face. And when we don't take the time to really think about our uniqueness of our user base and the diversity of our own user base or our client site's user base, we're missing the opportunities to really get to the next level of SEO. OK? And the web is really complex, and people are always going to look to scam the search engines because there's a lot of money to be made. But Google is going to continually go after them more and more. And while they're playing the yo-yo game, you can be building a steady foundation and building on top of that and just keep moving forward. Uh, and you're not going to end up wasting any time and or a lot less time than you ever did. It's truly a, a really amazing transition to get from narrow-minded thinking to much broader thinking about the work that we do. Prioritizing action plans. All right, so with prioritizing action plans, see, you've got a whole long list of things you need to do. Where do you start? How do you begin? Well. If you've got a site that's built on a templated environment with a content management system, whether it's WordPress or Joomla or any one of the many other content management system-based web platforms, there's quite often in the work that I do opportunities all over the place to fix or change the templates. And you're literally making a change on one, two, or three, or just a few actual pages, and because it's a templated system, those changes are instantly going to carry across the entire website. Okay, So you're going to be getting an exponential return of value for the time that it takes to address those issues. If you generate content from a database, the scripts that are used to pull that content from the database to display it on your website are quite often a place to look. So for example, 
the way you load page titles and where you get that content from. If you're loading your page titles with 50 words, change the structure and take the keywords from a different area of your database, instantly that script is going to positively impact your entire web's presence. All right, so look for those kind of opportunities. And then think about topical focus because that's the most important issue of all of the issues I've described. Topical focus is the single biggest issue. And most of the other issues that I talk about relate to topical focus in, a, in, in its own way. All right? So changes that need to be done sooner are topical focus related. And then how you can reinforce that focus by these different methods. All right? Uh, and that extends all the way to the off-site experience. Takeaways. Ask a series of questions as you go about your work. Is this sustainable or myopic? Does this dilute this page's topical focus? Is this forcing SEO too much? Can I eliminate some of these widgets and make my pages cleaner? So I have to have all these extra things going on on my pages. Is paying for cheap links really worth the risk anymore? Why wouldn't I want to help search engines figure out my content? Is there another way to look at this outside my experience? And finally, what's going to get me the most sustainable results with the least amount of effort? And there you go. That's my presentation. Thanks, Alan. Thanks that, for all the info. I hope that you found value out of it. You're welcome. Definitely. I'm glad we'll have the slides after this. It's all the info you gave us is pretty meaty, so I'm sure a lot of us will want to delve into it on our own time. Um, but we do have some time for some questions. So if you guys have any and you want to ask Alan, put, go ahead and put them in the question outlet or tweet us. Um, the first one is from Terry, and he asks, what if the existing site you're working on is structured flat? It seems like a bad idea, plus hard work to change it. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, the answer is going to depend on several other factors, and this is where critical thinking comes in as well. Just because something is an SEO best practice doesn't mean you should immediately go out and rip apart your website and make major changes unless you consider the ramifications that that change will have elsewhere. And that's why Terry's question is an excellent question, because it's critical thinking in that question. Well, yeah, OK, so flat, flat URL structure isn't the best practice. But if I make an entire change to 800 pages and their URLs, isn't that going to completely throw off everything else that's going on? Yeah, potentially it will. Absolutely. So you need to look at a few things. And it's. It's too complex an issue to just give a pat, single, standard answer in this shorter period of time, because you need to really look at several factors. But generally speaking, the first question that I ask is, well, how good is your situation now? Are you so successful that you're really happy overall, and you're just looking for incremental gains? If you're just looking for incremental gains, Radically changing your URL structure might not necessarily be a wise thing to do all at once. However, if all you're doing is URL structure changes that reinforce topical focus, even if you're doing really well now, changing URL structure can, in fact, be a good thing to do because it's just reinforcing topical focus. OK? But be aware that when you're doing that, you're going to end up needing to generate 301 permanently moved redirects for every page. So that's another thing to look at. What will happen if I instantly end up with 800 301 redirects? You need to look at that and consider, is the value that I'm going to gain from this implementation going to be worth enough to overcome the fact that instantly Google is going to be, oh my god, why did this site have, end up with 800 URL changes, right? Well, the good news is the search engines have seen from day one that even the biggest sites on Earth 
change their entire template design and URL structure at least once every couple of years. So having a huge volume of 301 redirects is not necessarily a bad thing all by itself. But again, do you have enough cross-signal reinforcement already in place from other factors? And do you have an existing off-site footprint that's really strong so that when you make the URL changes and you've got a massive volume of URL changes, Google's going to say, well, it's okay, we're good, we're not going to throw this site down to the curb and have them have to re-earn everything, right? You need to look at all the other factors. Everything's got to be considered in, in, in light of all of the other impl implications that it brings into play. Thanks, Alan. I have an interesting question from John. I'll be interested to hear your thoughts on it. He asks, how is B2B SEO different than B2C? So business to business, business to consumer. OK, well, B2B and B2C are different primarily because you need to think about your user's mindset and what's important to them, whether they're a consumer or they're a business. If you have a B2B website, more often than not, not always, but more often than not, even though it's an individual human being that's coming to your website to look for information, they're more likely going to need other types of information to make the case for them to be willing to do business with you than when a consumer is making that decision. So it's about the type of content and how it's presented more than any other single consideration when you talk the difference between B2B and B2C. All right, that's where thinking about your user's mindset comes from, the user mind model. And this is where in our industry and in marketing we talk about understanding different personas. That's where that begins to be the most important issue from B2B versus B2C. It's truly the same across the board for, very, for the overwhelming majority of other issues in that, well, a B2B website is going to need to have off-site reinforcement, but what kind of off-site reinforcement? There's going to need to be a certain volume of consumer reinforcement within social media, but you're going to need to get more links from business websites than you do from consumer websites when it comes to the link profile. It's those kind of differences that you need to understand. Thanks, Alan. I think it's interesting, the psychology of it. It's always something to remember and people forget is to put themselves in the shoes of who their target audience is. So thanks for that information. Yeah. I think we do You're have welcome. a question from Laura. And you did mention site speed in your presentation, and she just wanted to know if you could cover a little bit more about site speed and how that, um, how important that is now. Sure. Let me just go back up to the site speed slide. Site speed, site speed is about a couple of concepts. The search engines have shifted to uh, user experience uh, in different ways now, right? And it's not just about user experience either, though. The search engines have to crawl billions of pages of content. The reality is, for, for as much money as they have and as big as their networks are, there's still a tremendous volume of resources used just in crawling the internet, and it gets more intense every year. So if their system crawls your website and it has bottlenecks, or slowdowns. If there are too many slowdowns or too many bottlenecks to their ability to crawl your website, at a certain point, their system is designed to abandon your website. That's one of the reasons that having more than 100 or, in some cases, 200 links on a web page is no good. That's a great example of that, because they're only going to crawl so much, and then they're going to say, stop crawling, right? The other concept is if it takes more than a few seconds for your site to load, as they have the ability to determine what that means, their system is designed to say that means users are going to have a bad experience when they get to your website. 
And so they're comparing your site to other websites. And if your website takes four or five or eight or 10 or 20 seconds to quote unquote load, that's a bad user experience in their interpretation. It doesn't mean that when you go to the page, it's going to take 20 seconds to load. You might have your web browser caching the website. There might be a caching system in place for anybody who comes to your website to get the cached version, the stored version, right? But the truth is the search engines understand that not everybody is going to get cached content or stored content. And even if they are, it needs to be rapidly fast in its presentation. So when you get to the point where you've got 20 different JavaScripts on your web page because you've got all of these widgets and all of these social sharing buttons, right? Every script has to be an additional process. And quite often, more often than ever before, those scripts call a third party web server to be successfully executed. So you've got to go to the Facebook network. Even Google's own network, when you're processing Google APIs, right, on your web pages, right? And then uh, content delivery networks, all of your images stored on somebody else's web server somewhere else on the internet. They're being sold as the new buzz way to get real efficiency. Well, guess what? Nine out of ten of the clients that I audit that use content delivery networks have major speed problems directly related to the content delivery network. If you have 200 images and every image is called coming from a content delivery network, not only does the web browser that the user has have to go to your website to get that image, now they've got to go to your website up to your network, out of your network over the internet, back to your network and back down to their web browser. Okay, the inefficiency of content networks when not executed properly is one another key, more often than not, issue that I find with site speed. All of these issues add up over time, right? So check your site speed. Go into Google Analytics and look at the the page page level site speed data, and sort it by the slowest page speeds. You might be shocked at how slow their system thinks some of your pages are, even if you have a different experience. Then go to URIsLA.com and tools.pingdom.com, because even if Google says it's a problem, if you see that on both URIsLA and tools.pingdom.com, you don't have a problem, it doesn't mean you can ignore site speed, but it means that if you've got other issues that are really important, based on what I've just described or other things you know about, those might be more important from a priority perspective. But if you get any cross-testing environment confirmation that you have potential site speed problem, be aware that that should be one of the highest priority things you address because the value of getting that fixed is going to pay off over time. Thanks, Alan, for your wealth of expertise. I'm sure we could go on and on for another hour or so. Um, that's all the time we have for questions today, but I do see there are some more both on Twitter and the question applet, so we'll try to get those answered in the next few days before yeah. we post the webinar. And we will be posting yeah. the webinar, so if you do want a recording of this, and also we'll be posting the slides on SlideShare, this will all be available so you can get into everything on your own time. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for coming. Please mark your calendar for our next webinar. It's on Thursday, December 13th. Our very own Director of Account Development at Vertical Measures, Kayla Strong, will be speaking on the topic, Make 2013 Your Best Year Ever by Leveraging 2012 SEO Lessons. I've already opened registration for that webinar, so you can head over to our website, verticalmeasures.com forward slash webinars, and you can sign up there. So again, I'm Quinn, and thank you from all of us at Vertical Measures. We're happy to have you. And thanks, Alan, again. This is great. And thank you, Quinn, for inviting me to be presenting today. I greatly appreciate the opportunity. No problem. We enjoyed it. Have a good day, everyone.